Howdy, folks. It is wild that I get to finally say this, but... Hey, uh, just interrupting real quick to say that if you've seen this walkthrough on the Spitfire channel, then this one is basically the same. You can actually go click to the video that I'll link up there uh, where I talk to the singers from this library, and uh, it's a good way to get to know them, the people behind the library. Okay, that's it. Back to it. Welcome to Hearth and Hollow's second chapter, Folk Voices. I've had this one in mind since a good while before the first Hearth and Hollow was even finished. And the the response to that one, by the way, the Plucked Folk Ensemble, that far exceeded any expectation that I had for it. And I am genuinely not being hyperbolic when I say that your response to that library changed my life. This library is perhaps even more special to me, and I want to talk about that, but as always, I'm not interested in wasting your time. If you're here for the walkthrough and the audio examples specifically, then please skip to this timestamp. You probably know by now that I feel that songwriting is a pretty underrepresented flavor of composing in the world of sample libraries. That's a hell of a mission statement for a library like this, because we're talking about voices now. In the same way that a CG face can trigger that uncanny valley response in us. Uh, we tend to have the same problem with voices. Sample libraries can usually avoid this issue by focusing on stylized voices. Flawless session singers, operatic singing, big choral groups. That's just not what you can expect to come out of a person until they've gone through quite a bit of rigorous training that aims to sort of cut down on personal derivation. For good reason, by the way, when a big group of people approaches projection and vibrato in the same way, you get like a divine singularity. The trick is that the divine isn't human. So last March, decided to spend a couple of weeks in a 200 year old church with two very close friends of mine who happened to be the self-taught singer-songwriter type and sang. I asked them not to be very careful or to think too much or to perform. And just like that, I've got a vocal library that sits comfortably in music that previously I would have felt was too personal to mingle with sampled instruments. And it's because this library sounds like real people that you know. Some friends in the early spring vulnerably lending their voices to you. Okay, let's get into this walkthrough proper. This is the default ensemble patch. It's where I spend 90% of my time with this instrument. Meet Willow, Juniper, Hawthorne, and Forest. Willow is a solo singer that handles the upper range. Leader of the pack, clear, present, but soft like a sunbeam. Juniper is a doubled vocal with the upper range pushed way into the falsetto. The doubling is done genuinely as you would do on a record. Kind of has that Sufjan Stevens, Bonnie Vare thing going on. Hawthorne is a deep, gravelly solo singer. Tremendously intimate with some quaking and rasp. The upper register is like a honeyed whiskey. And last is Forest. This is Willow and Hawthorne singing together in octaves. It's like a little bit more hair on this, like it's more playful somehow. And I think it's a testament to what happens when two voices actually rub together in the air of the same room. Like the first Hearth and Hollow, you can move these singers around the room, adjust how much of the room bleed we're hearing, uh, stay tuned on that. The feel of this space is incredible. Unlike the first Hearth and Hollow, uh, we have these nifty little circles on top of the icons. Clicking these will create a perfectly mirrored ghost of the singer. This employs some clever sampling trickery that grabs a neighboring sample and pitches it up or down as needed, uh, resulting in a doubled version of the note that you play. I knew that if I was going to make a library that could be used in contemporary folky settings, this was something that we had to explore. And by we, I mean Owen Bolig, mad genius developer who has made every bell and whistle that you're about to see possible. Speaking of bells and whistles, here are the individual controls. You can bypass a singer, you've got traditional volume and pan, get a plate send, and then clicking on this label here brings up that singer's menu of articulations.
Sustains are what you've been hearing. Nice, soft underbelly, honest sound. When we push the intensity fader up, we hear a far more hearty sound. Whew. More shake and rattle. The note starts are especially groovy. This is the kind of upper velocity that I save for special occasions. If we drop back down, though, to having the main sustain sound, you can hear that while drastically tamer, those note starts also have a slight lilt. If you play the note at a very low velocity on your keyboard, you get a pure and more immediate note start. You lose a bit of the funk that gives the library some of its magic, but it really does come in handy. There are three vowels to choose from, m, u, and a. The button off to the side here links those vowels, allowing for you to blend between them using a CC of your choice. When just one of the vowels is active, you lock that selected singer into just that vowel. It gives you the freedom to blend vowels for some singers, keep other singers consistent, all within the same NKI. This is where the library starts to get really special. Let's snap all of the singers to the blooms in one fell swoop over on the presets page. And while on this page, you can toggle through some pretty useful mix presets. Let's set it to broad and gauzy. So blooms are a performed swell that taper back into silence. This is already really useful as is, but it's normal stuff so far. These have some important tricks up their sleeves, though. First thing is that they're tempo synced, but what's infinitely cooler is that these fix a big gripe that I have with all manner of pre-recorded swells or waves or arcs, whatever you want to call them. When you put down a new MIDI note, a new swell starts from the beginning of the swell. So if you're trying to change notes mid-swell, you have to do this weird little MIDI staggering dance. Realistically, you just have to resign to using these very statically. But check this out. Is that not so wild? As long as you keep at least one key held, it's kind of how legato works, you can change notes as much as you'd like during the swell without interrupting it. Everything stays tempo synced. Each note, no matter which one started earliest or latest, is gonna peak at the same time and resolve together, as real singers would do. It's just a grand slam for imbuing naturally sung movement into whatever it is that you're writing. Let's upgrade the blooms to something a little bit more complicated. The grooves are also tempo synced, and they use that witchcraft that allows you to change notes without interrupting the pattern. Rhythmic articulations in vocal libraries are always odd birds, and that's true here. These are really special. They're, they're impossible to recreate with just standard MIDI programming. Here's groove one. Groove two. And groove three. Because vowel changes are baked into the actual recordings of the grooves themselves, we don't really have a need for a vowel blending control. However, like the sustains, and like the grooves in the first hearth and hollow, we do have an intensity control. This simplifies and brings the grooves down to a quieter all mm version of the pattern. You know, it'd be fun. So if we brought in the uh, first hearth and hollow to show off the uh, intensity layer thing. I've said this before and it's still true. I'm not really keen on just dropping loops into the music I'm making. So it was important for me to find a lot of ways to control and sculpt these grooves so that they're going to fit whatever you're writing. Our last articulation is one that only the soloists have.
it's easy to get lost in there. Blossoms are very long passages, long recordings of lilting, droning. Every time you press a key, it starts you from a random position in that very long sample. Uh, it does a surprisingly good job of naturally varying the textures that you're building and avoiding any obvious repeats in the recording. This feature can be toggled off, though, if you'd prefer consistency. Let's actually head over to that page to look at some of the control we have over the instrument. Here under the sustain label, we've got attack and release, uh, good for unlocking the dreamy pad-like potential of the instrument. Release triggers are turned up to here by default, really helps with the realism of your note ends. These are actually disabled as soon as you cross into the pad territory uh, with the release control. And then down here, blossoms have attack and release, of course. And then here is that little random start toggle that I mentioned. While we're slogging through controls, let's go take a look at those uh, vowel and intensity faders I've been using. These are global controls. You've heard the vowel and intensity faders already, and volume is exactly what you'd expect. It's a global volume control. Uh, some articulations have different relationships to these faders, depending on what's baked into the articulation itself. Kind of mentioned this with grooves not needing a vowel fader. Uh, blooms don't have a need for the intensity fader, because that's what's being performed by the singers already. And then sustains utilize all three. By default, volume is on your mod wheel, or CC1. Intensity is on CC11, or the expression control. And then vowels are on CC21. Uh, if you don't dig that layout, you can just change it to whatever you want. Okay, so up until now, you've been hearing every singer being triggered together as a result of them sharing the same key range. At the top of the articulation menu, there are three piano icons that you might have spotted earlier. Good eye. Uh, click these bad boys to throw the singer into an upper, middle, or lower range. Um, and you can also tell who is in what range based on the color of their little bypass button. Uh, this was a huge development for arrangement flexibility. That was something that was a tough nut to crack in the first Hearth and Hollow, and so I wanted to address it to some degree here. Now, there does come a time when having each singer split into a separate track is useful, and that's where the solo patches come in. I won't spend too much time on these because there are only two main differences. The first big difference is that the articulations are key switchable. The other big difference is in Willow's solo patch. We recorded true legato for the mm, ooh, and ah vowels. <laughs> Now, this library isn't really focused on soaring, soloistic performances, but this is a nice tool to have in the belt, especially when you're layering it with the sort of chordal stuff that's being carried by your sustains or blooms or blossoms. Beyond these solo patches are two more bonus patches, a warbly whistle patch and a percussion patch. For the whistle, we've got legato, shorts, and sustains. And then if you engage this little linking button, similar to the ones we've seen with the vowel linking, you can toggle seamlessly between shorts and legato. It's a fun little sound. I honestly think it's really charming, and if you ever want to do your worst Andrew Bird impression, this is where you go. On to the percussion patch. Uh, this patch is an homage to the bygone era of the 2010s millennial stomp clap folk and as cheesy as that stuff was, it makes for a really good percussion kit. You can see we've got some new icons here. You can double these, like with the vocals and the whistle. These are actually so useful on the claps and the shouts that they're on by default. Before I sign off, I said I'd talk about the bleed knob. This space was really special. It's an old, creaky, woody church. Doesn't have the lush hall sound at all, but it's far greater than just a big room sound. Check this out. It almost feels like we're adding extra singers. That's just the power of feeling a space and its reflections. To explain what's going on here, the further a singer is away from the center where those mics are, the more you're gonna be hearing the room, 
as you would in a real recording environment. The bleed knob then controls how much of this effect you're hearing. This functionality creates a glue between the singers and their positions relative to one another in a room. I feel it's hard to recreate that just by setting mix knobs on reverbs and mic signals. Thanks for sticking around. I know this was a long one. Lots of stuff packed into this instrument. And none of it would exist without my friends, so thank you for taking that leap with me, guys. And of course, none of their beautiful singing would be at your fingertips if it wasn't for Owen Bolig, making all of my crazy pipe dreams into a reality. Hearth and Hollow Folk Voices is available now over at Spitfire's site. I'll link that below, of course. It would mean everything to me for this library to help you tell your stories. Take care of yourself, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>